two years ago in Florida, a 16-year-old vampire, Rod Ferrell, from the nearby state of Kentucky, brutally bludgeoned to death the parents of one of his teenage disciples in what was described as a ritual vampire slave. Rod, I think you're a disturbed young man. I think your family failed you. I think society failed you. But I also am here to tell you, in the considered judgment of this court, a troubled and disturbed youth cannot serve as an excuse for cold-blooded, premeditated murder. In spite of his youth, the state of Florida sentenced Rod to death. Now he's on death row, waiting to go to the electric chair. The electric chair has always been a uh, main icon in uh, the darker way of life. You know, everyone sees it as this uh, big majestic throne of death. So uh, I always did wonder what it would be like to sit in it and actually experience death through it. So that part doesn't really bother me at all. The story behind the teenage vampire killings begins in the small Kentucky town of Murray, where Rod Ferrell grew up. Before the murders, Murray had become home to a number of vampire cults. The people that dressed like vampires used to stay up here on the corner. Uh, they never really drove vehicles. They were always walking. They, for some reason, they never drove, or I never seen them in a vehicle anyways. But they would stay right up here on the corner, and that's where they would hang out. It used to be at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, you would always see them up at the local you know, fast food restaurant hanging out there talking or they'd be walking up and down the streets, but you just don't, you don't ever see them out anymore. I don't know if they've just gone underground or maybe someone will change their minds or what has happened to them, but you just don't see them as often as you used to. Right. Here we go again. This small group is the last of the Murray vampires. Rod was a member of this vampire family until a few weeks before his killing spree in November 1996. Vampire law forbids murder. Vampires believe that human life is sacred and that the regular cutting and drinking of one another's blood make them immortal. It's almost orgasmic um, to feel them uh, feeding energy from you and then um, drinking their energy into yourself. Um, <clears throat> I guess you could say, uh, say I had gone two weeks without feeding, it would be almost as if I were drunk, um, if I were getting drunk. Um, you would get a rush, a buzz, an adrenaline rush. Um, most people would deem, say that it's uh, psychological. It's no psychological. Um, there's something about it. There are those of us uh, who are of uh, a different nature, I guess you could say, of own peers, uh, who have a family all together of our own. Um, we have sires, childers, um, so on and so forth. Um, Jaden here is um, my sire. Uh, he's my brother as well, um, by blood, by birth. Um, this here is uh, Angelique. Um, this is her family name, Angelique. Uh, she is like uh, a sister to me. Um, Raven over here that is fiddling with his makeup uh, is a distant cousin, um, basically, of the family. He has been through the bond with, uh, I believe, every member of the family. Um, <laughs> so he might as well be uh, kindred He's with us. He's blood dog. We are, I guess you could say, more sexual than, uh, uh, is it safe to say, humans? Yeah, we're, we see ourselves as basically a different breed, a different race. It's almost as if, as if we're on a higher form of, you know, evolution because we get to where most people dream about the capabilities that we have, you know, and that we're able to accomplish and stuff. So these people that, you know, dream of being able to read people's minds and stuff like that, we actually can achieve that.
Bible Belt runs across America's southern states. This part of Kentucky is known as the buckle of the Bible Belt. Murray is an alcohol-free town and home to the National Scout Museum. To Murray's dismay now, vampire Rod Ferrell is their most famous son. Murray will continue to, uh, you know, harbor some type of vampiric lifestyle because of the fact that we've put it on the map. Or I should say Rod put it on the map, you know, in his little moment of idiocy, you know, sort of put Murray on the map. It was the retirement capital, you know, now it's the, one of the vampiric capitals. But these extreme behavioral animalities, such as uh, the, the, the involved the occult, I don't try to deal with them here. I just want them away from here. And we should try to prevent it from happening in Murray, Kentucky, or any place in the civilized world again, by being alert and taking those actions that are required to channel youth along a positive road. Break it down. Kick off, return. Kick off, return. Let's go. Return. Rod was born in 1980. He was only just 18 when he was sentenced to the electric chair, making him the youngest person on Florida's death row. Well, of course, my greatest wish would be to go back to the year 1992, you know, before I became, you know, and I guess you could say engrossed in the darker side of life, where I could just be a, a child again. As a child, Rod was brought up by his mother, Sandra Gibson. He never knew his father, Rick. I met Rod's dad in high school. We both went to the same classes together. We had homeroom class together, and we started going out, and we dated like a year and a half, and I got pregnant with Rod, and then we got married shortly thereafter and, uh, and divorced about a year later. Rick left very quickly after, after she got pregnant. In fact, I don't know that he ever saw Rod Farrell after the baby was born. Until, until he was in Florida testifying at the murder trial. They finally hunted Rick down, and um, he came to the trial. He was there one day, and he didn't speak to Rod at all. He called him the child, is what he called him. And uh, Rod cried really bad. That's the only time he cried. I never really had a father anyway. So, I mean, I looked to Jaden more as a father figure. I was with Jaden and the Jaden family for a few months. He had indoctrinated me into the vampiric way of life. He had taught me the true ways of it. Um, you know, separated the myth and legend from reality. I'm not pissed off at Rod. I'm really not. Uh, I never have been. I've, I've shed several tears because of what has happened because, you know, I love him. You know, he was a brother to me. And I thought, you know, that he was wise enough and mature enough to know not to do something like this. Jaden and Rod met one another in September 1995 at high school. They were both 15 years old. I was a senior in high school when I met Rod. Uh, he showed up out of the blue, out of nowhere, like after a quarter of the year had been completed. And people were constantly trying to get me and him to fight each other because he wore the trench coat. And I had this cloak that I wore because I just loved fucking with these kids at school. It was just great. Jaden was already the leader of a tightly knit family of teenage vampires okay. who acted out macabre the fantasy games. That I have called you all here is because the prince has declared a blood hunt. Keep yourselves concealed. I'd adapted more to what they called the freak lifestyle: combat boots, long hair, trench coats, sometimes on occasion the makeup, um, all that just to be different. To express myself. Because if you do, then we'll have to kill you too. He was the same as me. I saw me in his eyes at the time. <clears throat> he was, you know, tapping into the side of life that yeah, I was also, did. you know, Perfect. dancing in, you know. No, the darker walk. side of your soul, everyone has it. And he let it envelop him instead of, you know, pushing it away and trying to, you know, to hide himself. I had decided to take the uh, darker path, the evil path. I found that more exciting. And uh, I was willing to go the distance to um, 
see what that side held. In January 1996, Jaden invited Rod to become a vampire. The crossover was relatively simple. He uh, took me to Old Salem Cemetery, and uh, he took me to a certain tree where all chosen ones had been made by their sires. And that's when Jaden took out his blade, and uh, I made three slits on my left arm, and he drank from me, and then he made slits on his arm, and I drank from him. And uh, we basically sat in quiet meditation for a few hours before we departed. Rod became part of Jaden's vampire family of local girls and boys. Membership demanded total loyalty and obedience, and putting the family's needs above everything else. They made no secret of their beliefs. Their trademark black outfits and rumors of their blood drinking, drug taking and sexual rituals soon made Rod and Jaden notorious in the small Kentucky town. Things were going um, not so well in my life, and um, he and I were hanging out with many of the other family members, and uh, we decided to walk to talk about each other's problems and see if we could aid one another. And uh, we got to the end of the trailer park, and I picked up this uh, kitten, and I was, you know, petting it and what have you with that. And uh, it clawed me, and because of my state of mind, I was compelled to uh, do what I did, in which uh, I turned it on its back and held it by its neck and slung it against a tree, breaking its spinal column. He goes, see that tree? Grabs it and then goes, wham, slams it right into the tree and killed the cat. That's when I started, you know, pulling back away from him. Our friendship basically dwindled from there. A few months after Rod killed the kitten, an even grimmer incident happened at an animal sanctuary in Murray. It sickened the whole town. When I arrived at the shelter on October 14, 1996, what I noticed was uh, probably between 30 and 40 dogs running up and down our driveway here. And my uh, first thought was that someone's came down and freed the animals. That's what I thought. And uh, when I got to the fence here, um, what I noticed is that the, the actual lock was still locked on the gate. But as I entered um, to the uh, east of the shelter here, I noticed that our fence had been cut down the middle, and they had actually uh, rolled the fence back about 20 foot, 10 foot in each direction. You can see the fence here uh, where we've, we've repaired it now. Our grass out here, as you can see, isn't mowed. It's about a foot tall. In about a 30 foot area, the grass was just really flat, like you could tell that Several people had been here. It wasn't one or two people that came out and freed our dogs. Um, at that point, I, I kind of got a little bit scared. I went into the shelter and called the uh, sheriff's department down here. Um, when Deputy Max Parrish got here, um, he got to looking out in the field, and that's when he found the puppies that had been uh, mutilated. We started asking questions to people in the area. Uh, we got statements from several people who indicated it was a so-called vampire group that did it. People that we talked to and people that we charged indicated that it was just part of a ceremony. Uh, they tore the limbs from the animals and took the blood and poured it on each other and sort of a ceremony to uh, maybe initiate new members. It was, I can't say in relation to a murder, but for an animal it was the worst worst torture I've ever seen. Uh, like I said, the animals, while they were still alive, had their limbs ripped from their body. And a couple of them looked like several people had just stepped on them and, and pushed them into the ground. I went straight to the police station and I confronted the sheriff himself about it. I said, you know, you're looking for me about this. Um, I didn't do it. I can prove I didn't do it. I was evil incarnate to them before this, and now I'm just Satan himself, so... Not that I really care. We, you know, we live in a small community. Murray's not big, and 
you think that you know bad things don't happen here in Murray and for the next six to nine months after that yeah uh, yeah we had a when you seen someone walking down Murray Street with a, all dressed in black with painted fingernails men uh, yeah you, you know you you looked at them and you wondered you know what are you you know what are you <laughs> I believe Murray itself is evil. You know, there's so much cultic activity that was there then. I think it comes from with every citizen within Murray. Kind of like a Stephen King's novel. It's supposed to betray harmony and trust and peaceful existence, when in fact, beneath the skin, it's this raging demon who gets his rocks off by doing all sorts of blasphemous things. Six weeks after the animal shelter killings, in a suburban house 12 hours drive from Murray, there would be more violence, but this time as a brutal double murder. Two years after the murders on Florida's death row, Rod says he is still a vampire. Now most of the vampires have left Murray except for Jaden, who recruited Rod in the first place. Jaden continues to initiate teenagers into his cult. We really have no clue where, you know, actual vampirism started, but we know for a fact, you know, that archaeologists and scientists can prove that the myths of vampires goes all the way back to the beginning of time. I'm the sire. I'm the one that has chosen him. We watch the person. We ask questions about them with people that's known them for quite some time. Just to make sure, you know, he's gonna, you know, understand the severity of this and not take it lightly and not end up screwing up like Rod did. Because I can't handle another one of those. You cut enough to where you have at least, you know, a small stream of blood coming out. Just for enough to ingest like a few ounces or so then they will take from you. After that is completed, they will cut themselves and you will take from them, which is the crossover, the embracement. My blood tastes real metallic. It tastes like sticking a spoon in your mouth. Of course, then one of the people that I embraced actually said my blood tasted like dirt one time. I was like, wow, <laughs> you know? It's just, it's all on, you know, how your life is, uh, you know, stress level, whether or not your uh, adrenaline's rushing through your body that'll make your blood taste differently. Just, you know, normal, normal everyday stuff, you know, will cause your blood to have a different, you know, taste and different texture and color. Within the vampire family, 18-year-old Jaden is everyone's father. But Jaden is also 16-year-old Gabriel's older brother. The two brothers are very close. Their mother, Penny, condemns Jaden and Gabriel's vampire ways. Vampires, I call it bullshit. Vampires are mythical beings, okay? A figment of somebody's imagination written up in a book that's been made into a cult by kids who think uh, trips on acid like the 70s isn't good enough for them. They had to do bizarre things. Murray has one church for every 300 people. In this deeply devout community, the vampires are seen as evil in their midst. Good morning, good morning, good morning. What a great day, beautiful day outside. Great day to worship our Heavenly Father. We have a good number already seated. We have several that are still making their way in. We want to welcome you to our 9 o'clock service this morning. We would like to I think the uh, community of Murray is being um, as alert and the power structure as active as it can be to preclude um, anything like a vampire cult uh, so all could be saved. being Better promoted he from uh, hereabouts. Again. The curse upon the human race is sin. A lot of people look at us as being, you know, inherent evil, you know, beings out to cut each other up and, and destroy humanity and all that shit. And when it's them, you know, we live in a society of separation, you know, 
where they they don't they don't want to understand and therefore they're gonna fear it you know and what they fear and they don't understand they hate and what they hate they try to destroy when I was starting to deal with um, the uh, adrenaline rushes and bloodlusts the only thing I found that would calm the adrenaline rushes was uh, pain and uh, yeah I've done it quite a few times. Some of, them are, some of them are pretty fresh. That is when I embraced one of my closest friends. The rest of them, like these on the sides, were from trying to get rid of uh, adrenaline rushes. And I've got a lot more up on my shoulders if I can get them up. Self-mutilation, you know, cutting yourself, to me is the same thing as smoking a cigarette. You're knowingly taking something, you're damaging your body, and you know it's damaging your body, taking pleasure out of it, whether it's relief of stress, uh, calming your nerves, all that good stuff, it's the same thing, you know. When people are in emotional distress, you know, or crying, you know, and their smoker's like, give me a cigarette, you know, oh, I feel better, you know. It brings them some form of relief. It's the same thing as cutting yourself. You know, people better wake up because the big cities come to the little town, and whether it's gangs or whether it's vampires, they better open their eyes and see because they can be mom and daddy's perfect little angel and hell's brewing underneath. Rod and Jaden both left high school at 16. Neither had a job to go to, nor clear plans for their future. So what should we do with it? They fill their time acting out elaborate role-playing games with their vampire family of local teenagers. During his final months with Jaden's vampires, Rod began to test his strength against Jaden in these adolescent masquerades. One night, the playing stopped, and the fighting was for real. Scream! Better. Yes. <laughs> Jaden and a guy that goes by the name of Bones came up to the house. Me and Rob was home alone, and they uh, I could tell something was up. And then he made some kind of uh, uh, insinuation towards that effect of, the, of killing me and shit like that. And that's just when I went from laughing, I looked at him, I ran over, I grabbed him by his throat, picked him up, and slammed him into the brick wall and held him there, and his face turned like four different shades of purple. I was like, well, fuck, I think I'm going to kill him, so I'll let him go, you know. After I told him, you know, not to fuck with me because I'd beat his ass. My friend that was with me freaked out because I went from, <laughs> and then it was like instantaneous, you know. There was no fight to it. He just slammed me up against the wall, and that was that. I told him, you know, leave, go, because that night I would have killed him. Love him or not, I would have killed him that night. And of course, his mom was this big freak anyways, and she thinks that I'm trying to control her son, and I was like, no one can control Rod, okay? Not even you. I was out of control. I mean, most enjoyable, but out of control nonetheless. And uh, at that point in time, no one could really control me. I was very big on the drug scene. Marijuana, acid, uh, Occasional PCP, uh, crank once in a while, and uh, whenever I could get my hands on it, heroin. After the fight, Rod was banished from Jaden's family. Now outcast, Rod started to make new friends. One was 15 year old Michael Schaefer. Michael was crossed over by Rod. He was the first recruit to Rod's new vampire clan. We used to come out of here a lot. Um, it was, it was mainly because, like, this is where we went whenever we had problems, we needed to think about stuff, so we kind of named it the thinking spot. It's just <laughs> something that was uh, kind of fun. Michael was joined by other new recruits, who included Charity Kesey, age 16, Dana Cooper, 19, and Scott Anderson, 16. At that time, they saw me as their vampiric father. When they needed guidance, they came to me. I became close because of their feelings towards me. So I was willing to go the distance for them. 
we were never psychotic killers. We talked about a bunch of stuff, but it never really came down to it. Um, we always just like talked about it, like kill him later, you know, like that's next week, that's next Tuesday. <laughs> Rod, Charity, Dana, and Scott all planned to escape from Murray. I had uh, been planning to leave Murray for quite some time, at least six months. The police were trying to blame me for so many things. We just took off. We were just happy to leave Murray. You know, they had persecuted us from the beginning. Heather Wendorf, an old girlfriend of Rod's, lived with her parents in Florida, in the middle-class town of Eustis. Phone records show that Heather had been calling Rod for several months. Rod claims that Heather asked him to come to Florida to kill her parents. I had taken a, uh, what they call a golden dragonfly acid. I dropped a tin strip of that. We arrived in Florida, let's say 12 hours later. I called Heather up and I said, you know, look, either you join us or not. And uh, well, that's when the plans for the night had begun. Heather Wendorf met them outside her family's house on the evening of November the 25th, 1996. Rod and Scott made their way into the house on foot. The girls, Heather, Charity and Dana, remained in the car. Heather's parents were inside the house. When they got to this house, he stated that they circled and looked in every window so they could see where everybody was. The mother was in the shower and the daddy was laying in the family room on the couch. After circling the whole house, they entered a garage area, which is to our left, the left of the house. He decided to look for a little better weapon. And in doing so, they found a short crowbar. They then entered through the garage into a little washroom and went down past the couch where the father was lying. He didn't notice me. Scott followed right behind me as fast as he could and as quiet as he could because he had the TV pretty much cranked. It was as he started to turn around, I saw he was coming out and actually boom, right across the temple of the head. They knocked him cold. And while he was cold, I figured, now or never, because if he gets up, I'm a fucking dead motherfucker. So I just beat him until he died. Then... Did you strike him anywhere else with the crowbar or just in the head? I striked him once in the chest because he wouldn't stop breathing, so I stabbed him in the heart. You stabbed him in the heart? I took the bottom of the crowbar. It's like... And as I was heading back to the parents' bedroom looking for the Explorer keys, mm -hmm. that's whenever her mom came out through the kitchen area and she, like, started to lunge at me. She spilled her coffee on me went all over me and then she clawed my face and grabbed my wrist and that's when I took the straight end of the crowbar bar and just started bashing the back of her head. So she was running away from you when this no, was happening? She was holding on to me. Okay. She had her fingernails embedded in my skin. And until she let go, I was gonna beat the fuck out of her. And so finally where'd you hit her first? In the back of the head or the front of the head you said? Right there? Okay. I only hit her once right there. All the rest of the time was back here. You'll notice in the pictures, the big hole. I haven't seen him yet. Okay. <laughs> After that, they, they went through the rooms. They found uh, a set of keys to the Ford Explorer. When they got back here on the road, a couple of the girls des described Farrell as uh, had on a, a, a greenish type t-shirt and it was covered with blood and there was blood on his face and such. And then that's when they pulled around the corner and changed the tags and left the area. Heather's sister returned home to find the bodies of her murdered parents and called the police. Three days later, the runaway teenagers were arrested at Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Part one of the long road trip from Baton Rouge finally ends at the Lake County Jail. Teen suspects are booked into the jail. Right behind them, Scott Anderson and a very cocky Rod Farrell. He sticks his tongue out at cameras as he walks in. But his show is not over yet. Scott was sentenced to life without parole. Dana and Charity accepted 17 and 10 years, respectively. 
daughter of the victims, Heather Wendolf, was later freed. All those convicted came from Murray. I was uh, astonished, I was appalled. I, I couldn't, couldn't believe that it would have gone that far. Our community were horrified by it. They were just uh, bowled over, and they, uh, they were asking themselves, how could this happen with kids that grew up here in our, in our community or, or uh, communities around here in, in other neighboring counties? Uh, it, it, it has required, it, uh, you know, it has uh, uh, given people an opportunity for a lot of soul searching. Mom said uh, that the people had been shot. And I was like, no, that's not Rod. That's not his, his motif, I guess you could say. Uh, me and Rod had talked uh, several times about, you know, on a revenge basis, you know, like uh, our mother or our brothers or even our closest friends, you know, if somebody was to kill them, what would we do if we could get a hold of them? And we would, uh, we'd either cut them up slowly to where they, you know, this drive-by shooting shit to me is for pussies. That's, I mean, you don't, you don't experience anything. Bang, 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 you know, that's crap. No, it's, if you're gonna do it right, it's gonna be up close and personal. S cutting them up or beating every living shit out of them till they're dead. And when mom finally called me back and said, no, that they were budging to death, then I believed that Rod had done it. Michael Schaefer almost went on the ill-fated trip to Florida with Rod. I would have gone with him at the time. I mean, we weren't planning anything malicious. We were just planning on getting out of Murray and, like, starting to actually live a life, you know? I mean, it just took a turn, you know? It's just, I don't know, things happen so fast, you know, and it's just impulses aren't good. Fortunately for him, his mother had sent him to a treatment center for children with behavioral problems only days before the journey. I have the police coming over here saying there's been two murders and I would I just went to pieces. Uh, just the thought that, that my son was could have been could have been there if I hadn't put him where he was because he was on a, a runaway basis, like a runaway train. You find a way to stop it or it's gonna destroy itself. He says, Well, if I'd have been there I could have stopped it. You know. And the thing is is that he couldn't have. When a person is that far gone uh, up here, nobody counts. I mean, it's, I think that that uh, feeling of power that they got from associating with that group, it's kind of like a narcotic. It's, um, you know, we can do what we want and we're gonna live forever type thing. That was, that was Rod, that was his, that was his mistake. And he took, he took so many lives down with him. Not just the people he killed, but I mean, he took down a lot of lives. I truly believe not really anything could have changed it. I mean, um, if it wouldn't have been the Windorfs at the rate I was going, it would have been somebody, if not more people. Everyone in their life, except for rare exception, will come down to the point where they are faced with the opportunity to either kill or show mercy. Many of us will come to that point many times. And, um, I mean, it's really simple. It's either you do or you don't. It's not some big complex struggle like they would show in a movie or something. It is uh, rather simple. It's do I want to, don't I want to? Do I care of the consequence or not? Some of us say, no, we don't. And we perform the act. You stated it best to Baton Rouge Sergeant Ben Odom a long time ago. You said, and I paraphrase, when I killed those people, I felt a rush. I felt like I was a god. But I guess if I was a god, I wouldn't be here today, now would I? And that's just as true today as it was in Baton Rouge in the interrogation station. The jury unanimously decided to recommend to this court that Roderick Justin Farrell should die for each of his crimes. The court agrees with the jury that in weighing the aggravating circumstances against the mitigating circumstances, the scales of justice tilt unquestionably on the side of death. Rod's mother has moved to Florida to be near him. She visits Rod every week. 
A lengthy appeals process means it is likely to be eight to ten years before Rod is executed. We had lunch together and we walked. We have a little sort of uh, pathway in the room. It's a really large room that we sat in and uh, with the other death row inmates and their families or whoever comes to see them. And he blew me a kiss. He always does that just about all the time. And um, he gets kind of, I mean, his eyes are kind of teary like, but you just can't cry in there. I mean, that's one of the worst things you can do. Really showing emotions of any kind is the worst thing you can do. So, and I'm sure he looks forward to the next week and I write him every day. So that helps a lot. You can't really believe much of anything in here. You can't experience anything. Your day-to-day -day life is simply one program and one program only. So, unless something changes, I'm just waiting to die. Rod has a black and white TV that he watches. Um, he has no air condition where he's at at all. It has been over 100 degrees for several weeks now. What he does is he takes his sheets and wets them down, and then he'll put water on himself and lay on the wet concrete to stay cool in the daytime. He does have a radio, and he listens to the radio quite often. And he just recently got some drawing paper, so he can draw now. Um, he basically sits in a 6 by 8 cell for all but two days a week just sitting there eight feet away from the electric chair at the moment. Eight months after Rod was sentenced to the electric chair, the vampires in Murray have largely drifted away or have been driven to the outskirts of town. Jaden has been branded as partly responsible for Rod's path to murder. No one will hire me in Murray. I'm completely ruined there. I'll never be able to get a job there. Persecution by association is what I had to deal with. You know, if they're not gonna give me a chance to be who I wanna be, then fuck them, I'm gonna do it without them, you know? People look at us funny all the time, and it's just living in a small town, you know? Oh my God, he's the best friend of the murderer, you know? And it just, they just get freaked out about stuff like that or because we look different or because we act different or, you know. I don't think we have any more of a problem with, uh, with deviancy from the norm. I can't imagine a cleaner, nicer community in which to operate, and that's the reason I decided to locate a skating facility here. Youth that patronize Circus Skate of Murray are, are primarily uh, those who uh, want clean recreation without any association with alcohol or drugs or the what we would generally call the societal negatives. This place is just a big joke. It's, it's, it's a paper mache town is what this whole area is. How does everybody want these steaks fixed? I want mine, you know how I want mine. Rare. They're so fake here. And anything that's out of the ordinary is, uh, they're against it. You know, if, if you're not a redneck with a big truck and you drink on the weekends and talk about hunting and, and riding a bull and all that shit, you know, then or if you don't have anybody in this town that's, you know, got a lot of money, then you're not shit, you know? Why can't you put them all on there? Because they would all fit. 
Somebody give me the chips and the buns over there, will you? Somebody, anybody? Basically, warmed on both sides warmed. and browned. Not cooked, warm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me Long eating. Mm-hmm. Need some salt. In Murray, I think that uh, there is a battle between good and evil, and I think everywhere in the world there is a battle between good and evil anywhere you have Christianity. If you didn't have a good a battle between good and evil, then uh, you really wouldn't have Christianity. Last night I um, was embraced by Angelique. Got trashed. <laughs> then I made some cuts, and she drunk from it, and she made some cuts, and basically we just ex exchanged. This wasn't vampiristic urges. These were just depression, stuff like that. So it's kind of a emotional release to get the physical thing going. But these little bitty cuts that look are real fresh. They're um they're from last night and. It's um, belonging, I'll, I'll cook it after family, the someone to, to care, you know? It's what you get here. It's a family. People to take care of you, people to care. People to listen to you when you have problems. People that you can, you know, put your head on when you want to cry. be able to get a castle, you know, this huge castle and just live, you know, in this huge, like, commune, basically. And anybody would be welcome, regardless whether they're kindred or not. It doesn't matter. They could still come there, you know? That's fine with me. That's what I want. I want to, you know, stop this ridicule and all this uh, degrading bullshit that the world puts everybody through, you know? Penny's vampire sons, Jaden and Gabriel, hardly see their mother anymore. I thought when Rod Farrell went to trial and Sandra Gibson was out of Kentucky, that our lives would go back to normal. And it hasn't. And it probably will never be normal again. The vampires are moving on. Gabriel, Penny's younger son, is leaving Murray and his family behind. Our group of friends have lived in this house as residents for um, some time. And uh, just here recently, things have started to fall apart, you know. Um, couples are breaking up and such. And uh, our lease is up um, a day from now, I believe. A day or two from now. And uh, Everybody just decided to move one day, so uh, I'm on my way to Chicago. Well, I, actually and, and honestly, I expect to get a phone call telling me that, you know, they think they have a body that belongs to my son. That's, that's what I think. Because I don't think he's gonna survive in Chicago. Gabriel's not cut out for Chicago. Gabriel does not fit into most of society, and I don't know why, but he doesn't. Uh, I'm not too worried about him. I don't really mar worry much about when I move, because, uh, I mean, I've gone to the worst. I've slept under bridges because I had nowhere to stay. So, uh, you know, it couldn't get much worse. I imagine they have much uh, better bridges to sleep under there than what I slept under, a lot more spacious. Rod and Jaden are still only 18. The two teenagers were friends for a brief 12 months. They haven't seen one another since the trial. Now Jaden and his teenage vampires are leaving Murray for good. We're basically sick of this piss-hole, Bible-banging, Sodom and Gomorrah-infested shitbox called the Bible Belt, consisting of Murray, Kentucky, and Paris, Tennessee, and all the other surrounding areas. So. My wife and I, and my somewhat blood brother Raven, and I are all taking off to LA. 
We got a friend that lives out there. His name's David. And uh, Gabe's taking off to Chicago, Illinois. When Shade went to California for a couple weeks, uh, he talked to some gothics out there and he said that he was friends with us and they're like, wow, you know those people? You know, they're all like, I mean, they'd heard of us out there. So, I mean, it's not like a big deal. I'm from the city anyhow. I'm used to being a nobody, so. Well, as long as I don't have any people saying they're gonna whip my ass because I'm gothic. Oh, no. I figure they can, stickers. yeah, some redneck freaking out on me or something. I'm gonna run you over in my truck. <laughs> See if you can fly now. <laughs> yeah. You know, that crap. We're always the minority, always. I figure that out anywhere you go. We're always the minority, always. We've done it before. Um, where uh, me and Jaden went like many years without contact. But the bombs, but, uh, no worries. I mean, it, yeah. it's, uh, it's gonna suck. But, uh, you know, we'll have to deal with it because yeah. that's life, you know. You'll have email. I'm pretty sure we'll be able to find a job with no problem yeah. to the places that we're going because they're, they're major metropolitan industrial I mean, yeah. In cities areas, and shit, so. In these areas, presidents of big corporations are like us, they're gothics. So it's not really going to be much of a worry. When you see me, when you call my name, I will be Actually, it never really crosses my mind much. It's just as if any other thing I've ever done in my life. I mean, it happened, it's over. You know, I suffer the consequence, good or bad. In this case, bad. I'm here. In all that honesty, I really don't understand it myself. There's really no reason. Never was. The murder itself, I don't, I don't believe, was connected with the occult, period. Uh, it's just a mean individual that has no remorse. Uh, has nothing to do with, with vampires. The, the common sense person knows there is no such thing to start with. Uh, but uh, just a mean, hard individual.